Today we're going to talk about the dominant immigrant group to New York City during the first half of the 19th century, the Irish. So we're going to talk a lot about Irish struggles today, but to begin the Irish story, I think we should talk about really the one advantage um, Irish immigrants had over other marginalized groups in the new United States. Their whiteness mattered for quite a bit. They were served very well by the Naturalization Act of 1790, uh, which would make citizenship conditioned by race. The Irish and other European immigrants benefited from this, while the law targeted immigrants from China, Native Americans, African Americans, and people from places elsewhere in the world. Despite this, we're going to see that the Irish were still not welcomed as equals by American citizens. The Irish faced many of the same obstacles that later immigrant groups would face as well. Still, the 1790 Naturalization Act, which guaranteed citizenship on the basis of race, proved extremely advantageous to Irish and other European immigrant groups in comparison to African Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. Non-white groups weren't guaranteed a path to citizenship until much later. For African Americans, this happened after the Civil War with the passage of the 14th Amendment. While for Native Americans and Asian Americans, guarantees of a path to citizenship did not occur until the 20th century. Now, the two major European groups coming at this time were the Germans and the Irish. And while the Germans tended to go to the Midwest and settle in farming communities, uh, the Irish were leaving, as we're going to talk about in a second, tough financial situations in Ireland where they served as farmers, right? And so to escape that, sort of system that, that ended up forcing many of them to flee, they moved to cities, they moved to urban areas where the hope was at least that starvation as it occurred on a grand scale in Ireland would not be duplicatable. Between 1820 and 1860, as a result of the completion of the Erie Canal and the continuation of implementing the grid plan, New York City was exploding in terms of population and in terms of financial prosperity. During this period, Irish immigrants represented one-third of the total immigrants to the United States. Now, to understand the dynamics of what's happening in the United States and in New York particularly, we have to kind of look out and look at where the Irish are coming from. Uh, they are coming from Ireland, which is an English colony and had been for hundreds and hundreds of years. Prior to 1800, Catholics, of which most of the Irish are, couldn't own land, couldn't vote, couldn't get educated, and couldn't hold office in their own country. Their British overlords are literally treating these Irish folk as subhuman. Most Catholic Irish lived as tenant farmers on land owned by English landlords with often Protestant Irish folk managing properties. Irish people had long been tired of these conditions and many started immigrating to the American colonies and then the United States even before the Revolutionary War began. As a colony of England for hundreds of years, um, myths about the Irish character penetrated the understanding of the Irish outside of Ireland itself. And so when they came to the United States, it's not as if they were treated as equals right away. They were seen as less than still because the majority of white colonists who had rights in this new country were not of Irish origin and often carried with them stereotypes that emanated from the British experience colonizing the island. Now, before the Revolutionary War, the majority of Irish immigrants that were coming here, like the majority of the population of the United States, was Protestant. However, after the Revolutionary War, a new wave of Irish immigrants come and they're Catholic. This would lead to some tensions, as there was significant anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States, with many Protestants fearing a Catholic plot to take over the country. The obstacles faced by Irish immigrants to the United States, due to both their colonial status under English rule for hundreds of years, and for the newer arrivals, the fact that they were entering a Protestant nation with significant anti-Catholic sentiment, did little to stem the tide of immigrants as they were needed for major projects and as U.S. cities like New York expanded. In the 1810s and 20s, when New York City needed workers uh, to help expand its city on the grid plan, and New York State uh, and the nation as a whole needed workers to build the Erie Canal, mostly Irish men, older men, were accepted 
um, in large numbers, with about 50,000 coming between 1810 and 1830. But Irish women were coming in large numbers as well, with about 60% of the maids for upper-class New Yorkers being Irish in the 1820s. But the real explosion of Irish immigration uh, comes in the 1840s and 1850s, and it's directly related to an event called the Irish Potato Famine. Now, the Potato Famine was a worldwide event. Uh, the blight, or, or the thing that kills the potato, actually began in Mexico. It made its way um, throughout the United States and, and into Ireland. But it hit Ireland particularly hard uh, for a few reasons. Some of it was just bad luck, but much of it was because the Irish economy was designed to serve the British landlords. Irish Catholic tenant farmers would live on land owned by somebody else. They would work that land. Uh, those people who owned the land were almost always British. The crops or the, the farm livestock, they would go to Britain. The farmers themselves, these Irish tenant farmers, they were given a small plot of land from which they uh, had to grow food for their own families. Now, many of them, most of them, chose to grow potatoes because you could get sufficient nutrients and calories from potatoes even on a small plot of land. But in 1845, this crop that in Ireland supports 3 million people, it begins to die. The blight lasted until 1853, leaving between 500,000 and 2 million Irish people dead of starvation and related diseases. Meanwhile, the British did very little to support the Irish during this period. They continued to export food, take food from Ireland, and send it back to Britain for these British landlords to make money off of. While the people in Ireland were starving, their English landlords continued to be profitable. Some of them wanted to push the Irish off the land. As the livestock industry expanded, they found it more profitable than to have these tenant farmers working crops for them. So the British did actually very little to support the Irish during this famine. They saw um, as the Irish died, it, it benefited them in some ways. Some, like this uh, civil servant, Charlie Trevelyan, uh, wrote of what was going on in Ireland. Uh, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. So he was saying this starvation thing uh, that was going on in Ireland as they dealt with the famine, uh, that was God doing this. I, I mean, we remember from the last episode where we talked about uh, how the British thought the God was wiping out the Native Americans on their behalf. We see the same logic used to justify the humanitarian disaster that was the Irish potato famine. Many of those who didn't starve fled. About a million would leave Ireland, with um, with most coming to the United States, and of those who came to the United States, one quarter of them ended up in New York City. These Irish immigrants were not coming on cruise ships. They were um, on boats, many of which had been used to transport slaves just a few years earlier. They were herded on top of each other, and the boats on which they arrived were nicknamed coffin ships. Nearly a quarter of those Irish who sailed to the United States during this period died on the journey. The Americans carried many of the same stereotypes held by the British overlords of the Irish. As these political cartoons of the time show, the Irish were often drawn as subhuman. Uh, they were depicted as lazy, as violent, as drunkards. Uh, they were also depicted as part of a insidious Catholic plot organized by the Pope to overthrow Protestants um, and take control of the United States. This commonly held perception of the Irish deeply impacted the opportunities that people immigrating from Ireland, particularly Catholics immigrating from Ireland, that they would receive upon their arrival. When they arrived in New York City particularly, they were offered low-wage, unskilled work. So there are some stories of um, Irish folks being chosen to do a job um, that was seen as too dangerous uh, to send a slave to do because slaves had value while an Irish worker did not. And these two groups were actually used against each other. Um, black slaves would be used to undermine 
Irish workers who were trying to negotiate for better wages, while Irish workers were often chosen before freed African Americans for job opportunities. These Irish were forced into some of the worst neighborhoods in the whole country, um, particularly in New York City, Five Points was infamous for sort of the poverty and the crime of young men that had very few other job prospects and were rejected by the society around them. In the mid-19th century, about 55% of people arrested in New York City were Irish, and this is tied to two things, right? One is very few opportunities are being presented to Irish young men, and so they find some level of financial stability in a life of crime, uh, while simultaneously um, they're dealing with profiling. Depictions of Irish people in these cartoons and in speeches given by politicians had a profound impact in the way that people looked at Irish immigrants. It's a community that became associated with poverty, criminality, violence, and drunkardness. And these implicit biases impacted Irish relationships with law enforcement. This mirrors how stop and frisk led to mass arrests in minority communities in New York City under Mike Bloomberg's mayorship. Until the end of the 1800s, really, uh, after the Civil War, Irish uh, are assumed to be criminal uh, and were arrested at a very, very high rate, 55%, despite just representing 25% of the city. The negative portrayal of Irish in uh, popular culture like political cartoons did have real ramifications for the physical safety of the Irish, as throughout the country there were acts of violence against Irish populations. In New York City alone, you had the Christmas night 1806 riots by Protestants who tried to burn down a Catholic church. Protestant gangs succeeded in burning down a Catholic church in New York in 1831. Anti-Catholic Protestant gangs coalesced around a political organization that ended up being called the Know Nothing, because when people asked them about the organization, they would say, I know nothing. They believed, in the words of historian J.P. Dolan, that Protestantism defined American society. From this flowed their fundamental belief that Catholicism was incompatible with basic American values. Uh, we hear this about religion sometimes. Uh, in the 19th century, it was the Catholics. After 9-11, a lot of the same rhetoric was produced about Muslims, uh, and Muslim Americans faced the brunt of some of that hostility. While the Know-Nothings had a series of victories in the 1850s, winning the mayorships of many major cities and wielding significant political power in New York City itself, their support began to fail around the time of the Civil War. While the Irish certainly expressed their frustration against the Protestant majority and especially wealthy New Yorkers, the majority of their outrage was directed towards African Americans, and this manifested in multiple ways throughout the course of the 19th century. In the 1830s, a mob, including many Irish immigrants, destroyed black homes and businesses and announced themselves in opposition to abolition. There was a real fear that freed slaves would come and compete with the Irish, lowering their paychecks and hurting their job prospects. The most famous incident of anti-black violence by mobs heavily comprising of Irish New Yorkers took place in 1863 with the draft riots. In 1862, when Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address, he announced that all slaves, albeit in southern states, were then free. This sort of changed the perception of what the war was about for many Irish folks who thought they had been fighting to preserve the Union. The Battle of Gettysburg, which preceded Lincoln's address, cost the Irish community of New York many lives. In 1863, it was announced that hundreds of thousands would be drafted. Every white male under the age of 35 was eligible. Though many would serve bravely in the war, blacks were not citizens, and thus they were not eligible for the draft. Still a largely impoverished community, unlike wealthy New Yorkers, most of the Irish could not afford an exemption from service. The Irish saw themselves as fighting a war to free the slaves and damage their own job prospects in the process.
Further, they understood the war was extremely profitable for wealthy businesses in New York City who were receiving war contracts to supply the troops. While many of the rioters attempted to express their anger directly at the wealthy in New York City, African Americans of the city proved far easier targets. Estimates of the total debt range between 120 to 2,000. In addition to taking black lives, the mobs attacked the black orphanage in New York City. No longer feeling safe in the city, 12,000 African Americans moved out of Manhattan and to Brooklyn. Due to their rising political power, many of these Irish people who were protesting that they would be drafted to fight in the Civil War, a cause that they no longer saw as their own, were eventually exempted from the draft. Despite the initial hostility they faced, to many in New York City politics, it became clear very quickly in the 1840s and 1850s that this collection of Irish immigrants could become a force in New York City politics. While initially organized as an anti-Catholic organization, Tammany Hall quickly changed its tune and began providing services to newly arrived Irish immigrants. The expectation was that these people would then vote with Tammany come election time. In the second half of the 19th century, the Irish were able to consolidate their influence over city government. Tammany instituted a spoils system by which their Irish supporters were able to access jobs in the police department, the fire department, as construction workers and builders for the city's various projects. Other groups like African Americans were often shut out from these employment opportunities. So this had pretty big ramifications uh, when a massive urban project got underway in 1859. This was coming off of a depression, the worst depression in the country's history up to that point in 1857. So you had a lot of people who are out of work. Uh, the first people always to get fired are the people on the bottom rungs of society. And so at this time, this is the Irish, this is the African Americans, and, and other marginalized groups. And so this massive construction project offered possibilities for a lot of groups seeking employment. If you haven't figured it out already, I'm talking about Central Park. When they laid out the grid system, they made a pretty serious mistake. The people who were designing the grid system didn't create space for parks. And so as the city continued to move upward and green spaces disappeared, the city was congested and the air was increasingly dangerous. A decision was made by city leaders to invest in a massive park that stretched miles over the center of the island. However, there was a small problem, as people were living in the space designated for the park's construction. There was a community of immigrants, mostly Irish and Germans, as well as a fairly prosperous community of African Americans. These settlements were burned down to make space for the park. Understanding that construction of the park would be a massive endeavor that would take thousands and thousands of workers, choosing who those workers would be, became an extremely important decision for the park's designers and city leaders. It was decided that African Americans would be excluded from this work, with some leaders suggesting they would be unable to peaceably work on the project alongside Irish immigrants. This division among working class and marginalized peoples was successful in preventing class solidarity between African Americans and Irish immigrants who conflicted with each other more so than with the power structure that pitted them against each other. The park was built uptown where the wealthier residents of the city lived, although poor people were allowed to come to the park, it was much more convenient for people who lived uptown, which is then no higher than 59th Street, to access this green space than people who lived way downtown. This part of town was significantly poor and inhabited by immigrant populations like the Irish. Tammany Hall, the institution that did so much for newly arrived Irish immigrants, as it gained more and more influence in the city, found itself in a number of corruption scandals, the most famous of which centered around Tammany boss William Tweed. Overseeing the construction of a courthouse, Tweed and his associates were found to have spent $5.6 million in 19th century money on furniture alone. The project took decades, with Tammany leaders skimming off the top. 
stop. While Tammany would become synonymous with corruption and Boss Tweed would die in prison, there was no waning of Irish influence in the city. In 1880, the first Irish Catholic mayor of New York City, William R. Grace, was elected. And in 1928, an Irish Catholic out of New York City named Al Smith became the Democratic candidate for president. While ultimately unsuccessful, the Irish of New York had successfully assimilated and gained influence in the United States less than a century after the Irish potato famine. The real reason you guys were all watching, Rosie say hi, congratulate them, they finished another one. Another one, lecture number three, yay!